Now let's discuss figuring out how much you should raise to before the flop when you want to raise or re-raise. And we'll also discuss how to calculate a pot size raise in general. Here is my chart for recommended pre-flop raise sizings. We're gonna take this chart slow to make sure you fully understand how to utilize it because it explains how much you should make it in pretty much every common scenario you're going to be in. So first things first, let's look at stack depth. As the stacks get deeper and deeper or shallower and shallower, that will impact your bet sizing. Let's take a look at this very first line here. When you have between 60 and 125 big blinds, when you are folded to, that means when everyone folds around to you, that means no one raised, no one called, they just all folded to you, you're gonna want to make it about 2.75 times the big blind. So if you're playing in a tournament with 50, 100 blinds, you're gonna wanna make it something like 275 in that instance. As stacks get shallower though, you're gonna want to raise to a smaller and smaller amount. Like say you have 25 big blinds, 2,500 chips at 5,100 blinds. Well, now you're gonna make it about 2.25 times the big blind or 225 chips. And that's essentially because as stacks get shallower and shallower, you don't need to risk as much on the current betting round to get all of your money in by the river when you feel inclined. But as stacks get deeper and deeper, you need to make the pot bigger earlier in the hand in order to be able to get all your money in by the river when you feel inclined. Notice though, when you get down to fewer than 12 big blinds, I recommend mostly just going all in. And that's because essentially if a raise or bet would put in more than 30% of your stack, you should usually go all in instead because once you put in more than 30% of your stack, if your opponent re-raises and it gets back to you, you're getting roughly two to one pot odds. So you only need to win about 33% of the time to continue and most hands in most scenarios are gonna win more than 33% of the time. So instead of giving them the option to put in that raise, you'd rather just go all in and apply maximum pressure to them instead. So that's how you're gonna play when you are folded to. Also, I say here, raise even larger as stacks get deeper. If you're playing 300 big blinds deep, maybe you wanna make it three and a half big blinds when you're folded to, or four big blinds when you're folded to. When you're facing one limper, that's someone who just calls the big blind, and then everybody else folds to you, when you are playing 60 to 125 big blinds deep, you're gonna to wanna to make it about 4.5 big blinds. So if you're playing five, 10 no limit hold'em and somebody limps for $10, you're gonna to wanna to make it something like $45. You may say, why so much more than when there's no limpers? Well, because once the limper puts in their one big blind, they're announcing they have something, right? And when everyone folds back around to them, if you make it only 2.75 times a big blind, they only have to put in 1.75 more and they're having to risk almost no amount of money more to see the flop. So they're not really making a mistake. You make money in poker when your opponents make mistakes, not when they play well. And by making it decently large in this scenario, you're gonna result in them calling often from out of position in a spot where they are not getting nearly as good of implied odds. You essentially wanna cut down on their implied odds when you are playing deeper and deeper stacked, which raising larger does. As you get shallower, you raise less over the limpers, but still you know, more than you would if there was no limper to begin with. Uh, when you're down to 12 big blinds, again, you're just gonna go all in. Now, what about when you're facing a raise? So let's say we are playing five, 10, no limit, and somebody raises to $30 before it gets to you. If you are in position, you wanna raise or re-raise to three times their bet. So if they made it 30, you'll make it 90. And if you're out of position, you're gonna wanna make it 120, four times their bet. Uh, just to confirm, out of position means you're going to be acting before your opponent's post-flop. So when you're in the big blind or the small blind, if someone raises and you want to re-raise, you're going to make it four times their raise amount, their total raise amount. If you are in position, though, the button cut off, whatever, you're going to be making it three times their initial raise amount. And then again, as stacks get shorter, you're going to raise a little bit less. But notice once you're 12 to 22 big blinds now, if you were to put in nine or even six out of your 12, well, that's half of your chips already, right? And so you're just gonna go all in when you get down to 12 to 22 big blinds, okay? What about when you are facing a three bet? So this is when, let's say you raise to 2.75 times the big blind, someone re-raises to eight and it gets back to you. Well, now, if you're in position, you're gonna wanna make it something like 2.75 times their last raise amount. So if you go 2.75, they make it eight, you're gonna to wanna to make it something like 22 in position. From out of position, you're gonna go a little bit bigger. Notice now, 22 to 35 big blinds, if you were to make it, well, 22, obviously that is way more than 60, way more than 30% of your chips, so you're just gonna be all in at this stack depth at this point. 
And this is how you're going to want to play in all of these scenarios when you are playing heads up against one other player. Let's discuss against limpers when lots of people limp. Because I know, especially in a lot of small stakes games, you're going to be facing more than just one limper. And in these scenarios, you're going to want to use roughly a pot-sized raise. The formula for a pot-sized raise is you take three times the last bet that was put in the pot, plus any additional money that is already in the pot. So let's say there is one limper from the cutoff. How much should we raise on the button? Well, three times the last bet, which is one big blind from the cutoff, plus the big blind, plus the small blind, is 4.5 times the big blind, which if we go back up here, is exactly what we had earlier, right? And then as you get shorter, you can make it a little bit less. What if there are multiple limpers, though? Well, say the low jack limps, high jack limps, cutoff limps, how much do we want to make it on the button now? Well, we do three times the last bet, which was the cutoff's call, plus the high jacks, one, plus the low jacks, one, plus the big blind, plus the small blind, and now you're making it 6.5 big blinds. So you're going to want to make it more as more people are in the pot to cut down on their pot odds. And because you're risking a larger amount to win a pot that is a larger amount. This formula also works when there's a raise in front of you. Say someone makes it three big blinds and someone calls. Well, if you know normally you wanted to make it three times the opponent's last bet, you do that as well. So that'd be nine, big blind, uh, nine times a big blind plus the additional money in the pot, which would be the call in the middle. So you essentially have three times, let's say, a three big blind raise plus a three big blind call, and that's going to go up to roughly 12 big blinds or so. I realize it's a little bit off, but that's that's the same formula we have here. And the way you can think about this to sort of shortcut this is to say, I'm going to make it whatever this chart says plus the additional call amounts in the middle. So someone raises to three and someone calls and someone calls, and you're in position with a deep stack, you're going to want to make it roughly 15. Okay? And that is how you go about figuring out how much to make it in lots and lots and lots of common scenarios. And if you follow this chart, recognize we're not doing anything based on the strength of our hand. We are raising based on the strength or based on our range and our position and our opponent's actions. And by raising to a predetermined size that is not based on your actual hand, that's going to make it very difficult for your opponents to know what you have. And anything you can do that conceals information about your hand range from your opponents is very, very valuable. Recognize this is the opposite of what a lot of small stakes players do. When they have aces, they may make it tiny or they may make it huge, essentially to an amount different than they play a lot of their other hands. And when they do make that abnormal play, if you're paying attention, you know they have aces. And if you know they have aces, that will make you play very differently than if you have to be concerned about them having ace king or ace five suited or nine seven suited, right? So anything you can do to conceal the strength of your range is very important and sticking with these Preflop size, this is going to go a long way to doing exactly that. Have you ever studied GTO poker strategies and thought it actually made you worse at poker? Well, it probably did. And that's why we have created Peak GTO, the easiest place to learn GTO poker strategies where you'll be learning directly from top pros so that you can improve your skills, bump up your poker ELO rating, and actually get really good at poker. Get started for free right now. Now let's discuss the concept of minimum defense frequency. The minimum defense frequency, or MDF, is the portion of your range that you must continue with when you are facing a bet so that you are not immediately exploitable by bluffs. And this concept is very important on the river because the hand is over after the river. You are going to realize whatever equity you have. But it is far less important on the flop and the turn because on the flop and the turn, you will always either over-realize or under-realize your equity like we discussed earlier in this math course. So this means that you should either overfold or underfold compared to the minimum defense frequency on the early betting rounds based on other game theory concepts such as position, range advantage, nut advantage, and stack to pot ratio. But you do always want to keep minimum defense frequency in mind. The formula for calculating the minimum defense frequency is one minus the bet you're facing divided by the bet you're facing plus the current pot. So let's go through these examples. If your opponent bets 25% pot, minimum defense frequency is one minus 0.25 divided by 0.25 plus one. The pot is one, right? Because they're betting 25% pot, the pot is one. And this is 80%. 
That means that if you are trying to adhere to the minimum defense frequency, such as on the river, you need to defend with at least 80% of your range. Otherwise, your opponent's bluffs are all going to be immediately profitable. If your opponent bets 50% pot, minimum defense frequency is 67%. You need to call with 67% of your range or more. If they pot it, notice now minimum defense frequency is 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus 1 equals 50%, which means you need to defend with 50% of your range or more. And if your opponent bets two times the size of the pot, you need to defend with 33% of your range or more, which actually means you get to fold quite often. Recognize, though, that you do not need to adhere to the minimum defense frequency when you will underrealize your equity. A really, really common spot where this comes up is when someone raises, you call from the big blind with a wide range, you're out of position and your range is not great. The flop comes, you check, and they bet. That's a common spot where if they bet, let's say 25% pot on the flop, and the minimum defense frequency is 80%, you may only need to continue 60% or 50% if you're trying to play good, strong, perfect poker because you're going to drastically underrealize your equity on the flop and the turn and the river. So that's the spot where you're always going to want to under un, uh, overfold because you're going to underrealize your equity. Let's take a look at a spot where you are going to want to adhere to the minimum defense frequency, though. Let's say you're on the river facing a 25% pot bet, and you estimate that your own range is roughly 25% ace high and worse in this scenario. So the question is, should you call with ace four for this junky pair? Well, in this spot, our opponent's betting 25% pot. Minimum defense frequency is one minus 0.25 divided by 0.25 plus one, which is 80%. So we need to defend with 80% of our range in this situation. And if we know that the bottom 25% of our range is ace high and worse, well, then obviously a pair is in the top 75% right? So if the pair is in the top 75% and we need to defend with 80% of our range, we cannot go around folding this ace four. This is a spot where a lot of people mess up. They call a flop bet, call a turn bet, and then fold on the river to a small bet in a spot where they have to defend a lot. And this is why you'll see a lot of the best poker players, especially when they're playing smaller and medium stakes tournaments, they do a lot of frequent small betting because their opponents overfold too often on every single betting round. So this is a spot where because we're facing a small bet, we need to be defending with 80% of our range. We know that any pairs in the top 80%, therefore we have to find the call. Now, again, I don't think you need to go th through and figure out your minimum defense frequency in every spot because quite often you should be calling more or less often whether uh, based on whether or not you're going to underrealize or overrealize. But you do need to be aware of this, right? As you're facing smaller and smaller bets, you must continue more often. And as you're facing larger and larger bets, that's when you can start finding lots and lots of folds. Now let's discuss the very, very, very important topic of fold equity, which is again, something you don't need to be calculating at the table, but it is something you need to be very aware of. Recognize that you do not have to show your cards and make the best hand at the showdown in order to win the pot because you can bet and make your opponents fold. And your fold equity is the amount you gain when your opponents fold to a bet. Some people think this is something you only need to be concerned with when you are bluffing because you're making your opponents fold out better hands. But even when you have a good hand and are value betting, quite often you are making your opponents fold out little bits of equity and that equity goes directly to you. For example, say we have pocket queens on a 10, 8, 7, 2 board and your opponent has ace 5. You presume that if you bet, they will always fold. A hand that's in very bad shape. If you check though, you presume they're never going to bluff the river when they miss and also you presume they're not going to pay you off if they river a five. Let's say in this scenario, the pot is $100. Your opponent has 6.82% equity, which is when they hit an ace to beat your pocket queens. If you bet and make them fold, you are forcing them to fold out $6.82 worth of equity because that's how often they would spike an ace on you. So by betting, you win that money that should not actually belong to you. And that is a good result. When you get your opponents to fold out equity, especially when you won't make that equity up by them bluffing you on the river or checking and then hero calling with ace high, it's going to be a really, really good thing for you. The more fold equity you have based on your opponent's tendencies and range, meaning they are generally just very tight and they like to fold a lot, or their range is way too loose and they have to fold a large chunk of it because it's just all garbage, the more money you make by betting. Essentially, the more money your opponents are how the more often your opponents fold for whatever reason, the more money you make by betting in general. 
Larger bets usually have more fold equity than smaller bets, because if you go back to the concept of minimum defense frequency, as you bet bigger, they should be folding more often. That said, smaller bets will give you a better price when you're bluffing because you're risking relatively little to win a lot, and that's clearly very good for you. Also, your table image is vitally important. If your opponents think that you are a weak, tight, straightforward player, you should be bluffing like crazy because they are going to think that when you bet, you have a very good hand. Alternatively, if they think you're absolutely nuts and they're just never going to fold any ace higher, better made hand to you, well, then they're going to be calling you down very, very wide and you're going to lose a lot of your fold equity. In exchange for losing your fold equity, though, you're going to get paid off with a lot of your good hands, which may let you value bet thinner with those. So always keep your table image in mind. Let's take a look at a spot that comes up in a tournament quite often. Let's say we have 15 big blinds on the button with nine, eight of spades. And you want to ask yourself, is it profitable to go all in with the nine, eight of spades? Well, you have to figure out how often each of your opponents will call your all in. Let's say the small blind will call 20% of the time and the big blind will call 25% of the time. Maybe these numbers are different. Maybe they call 10% and 15% or maybe they call 40% and 80%. This is where you have to figure out their strategies. When called, you will have roughly 40% equity on average against these two ranges, okay? As their range is tighter, you'll have less equity, but they'll be folding more often. Well, in this scenario, our equity of shoving is 55%, which is roughly how often they will both fold, times the pot that we steal, which is the small blind, the big blind, and the ante. I know we don't have the ante in the pot, but small blind, big blind, and the ante. So that's 2.5 big blinds. Plus the 45% of the time when we get called times our equity in the pot, which is 40% times the total pot. It'll be roughly 31.5 or 32.5 big blinds minus the amount we're putting in, which is 15. So when we shove and they fold, we get 1.38 profit minus the amount we lose when we get called, which is 1.08 on average. And that is 0.3 big blinds profit. That may not sound like a lot. It may not sound like it's worth justifying taking the risk to lose your whole stack, but 0.3 big blinds is actually a lot. And this is a scenario you should simply never pass up on. But it's a spot where a lot of tight players fold over and over and over again, and they wonder why they don't accumulate chips in tournaments. This is a spot where you need to be shoving. By the way, like I said, if your opponents will call less often, this number here will be bigger, right? And this number here will be smaller, typically, even though your equity will be less than 40%. Maybe it'll be like 30%. And you can tinker with this to figure out if you should be shoving, um, wider and wider because I mean if you have the 7-2 offsuit if these numbers are the same your equity is going to go down a lot when you get called obviously but if they're folding you know 70% of the time total that will make more than make up for the fact that when you do get called you're in terrible shape so you may find that against some weak tight players you can actually shove really really wide <sighs> recognize though that playing aggressively like this and betting and winning pots that don't belong to you will sometimes result in losses and sometimes big losses. Sometimes they're going to get stacked when you shove that 9-8 suited, but that is fine. Variance is okay. Do not worry about the inevitable swings of the game. To win at poker, you have to find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. And if you're consistently making plays over and over and over again that when you point three big blinds, again, it may not sound like a lot, but if you do that over and over again, the money is going to consistently flow in your direction. And winning lots and lots and lots of small pots without getting called is a great way to consistently chip up.